I'm Lauren Maloney, and welcome back to What Matters This Week. Joining me today is Dr. Leslie Ann Dupini Giroux. She's a Vermont State climatologist, a professor at the University of, of Vermont. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation, Lauren. It's always wonderful to be on 2244. Thank you. And you are really having quite a week because on Monday, you presented at COP26, where all of the world leaders right now are convening to talk about climate change. The President of the United States was there, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Let's, let's take a step back. Who asked you to take part? So the, the invitation actually came from the Executive Director of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, Mike Cooperberg. And he, he asked me, um, you know, the White House Office of Science Technology Policy Program is putting together this, this group of scientists to, to talk about um, climate change science from a past perspective, a present perspective, and a future perspective. And he wanted to know if I might be interested in, in, in handling the present piece. And so that was like, oh my goodness, me. And so it, it was one of those sort of like, you know, once in a lifetime opportunities to, to bring all together, all of the, the information, the science, the people that you have talked to and learned about all in this one place, all in the space of five minutes. Okay, yeah, so you had five minutes. And again, the, the title of your presentation, The Past, the Present and Future of Climate Science, you had present. How did you figure out what, what you were gonna fit in just a few short minutes? So I, I think for me, um, it was going back through and thinking of all of the things that were part of my research, all of the various committees that I'd ever sat on, all of the stakeholders with whom I had ever interacted, um, bringing together all of the, the, the pieces of um, multiple ways of knowing human vulnerability and the way in which um, climate change affects people differently from a location perspective, from a socioeconomic economic perspective and how I could really find just the key words to encapsulate all of that in that short amount of time. Definitely. Now, you, of course, were there virtually. You couldn't travel to Glasgow, Scotland, but do you know if any dignitaries were present? Well, I do know that um, the Prime Minister of uh, Trinidad and Tobago was there because I was born in Trinidad. And so um, one of my, my high school colleagues actually sent me the Facebook clip of his presentation. So I was watching that and it's sort of surreal to see um, the, the, the Prime Minister of the country that you grew up in um, presenting and talking about what it means for a small island nation to, to be on a national stage and to, to be facing some of these very, very similar challenges from a financial resourcing perspective, but also from a, a natural environment and coastal erosion part of, 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 of climate change in particular. So it's, it's sort of surreal from so many different perspectives, but I think it's, um, it just brings to, to mind how core and how much we are all in this together. You had mentioned a little bit about the personal, but professionally, what did it mean for you to be a part of this? Professionally, I don't think I have the words, Lauren. I think it's one of those things that I wasn't expecting to be invited. And so you're, you're like still a little bit shell-shocked that you were invited and that you were part of this. I mean, it's it's such a privilege. It's such an honor. Um, but once you, you sort of move past that, you realize this tremendous opportunity to lift up so many voices, to lift up so much science, to lift up so many different perspectives um, in, a, in a way that um, is, is coherent, is cohesive, it's whole, and just hopefully takes things to the next level. Now the conference actually goes a, a bit longer until November 12th. Will you be tuning in, um, you know, for, for some different speeches perhaps and what else are you interested in maybe seeing or hearing discussed so it, it's so um wonderful and overwhelming to have something of this magnitude go on for two two weeks but i think um, we, we need to have something at least that long because there's so many moving pieces because we need to take such a systems approach to looking at, at everything that goes into climate change and trying to address climate change both from a mitigation and adaptation perspective and I think um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in apart from trying to catch up on some of the speeches is to bring it into my class and so I'm teaching climatology this semester and I've already started to pull in some of the resources some of the links some of the, the various sort of cutting edge 
pieces that are coming out for my students and for them. Again, this is another one of those lifetime or once in a lifetime opportunities for them to be in class, to learn about this, and then to see it on a, on a global stage in real time. You know, in recent years, there has been so much focus on climate change, but there have been, you know, this is COP26, there have been other conferences of this type, obviously, in previous years. What has changed? What's made um, this conference so imperative, maybe in 2021? I, th I think um, why COP26 is such a hinge point, such a watershed moment, is um, it sort of goes back to that IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out in August. And it was so weighty, it was so meaty, it was so um, full of um, all of the nuances and new things that we know about climate change. And it was, it was such a, a large document. There was a little bit of sort of like, because of, of all of the, the implications and the fact that the, the rates of climate change are so much faster than we had projected. And I think um, COP26 coming now, a couple of months after um, the IPCC AR6 report, is 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 critical because we we now have a couple months to kind of start to process that a little bit and to see some of the shifts in terms of how do we how do we work with this right how do we actually try to to make sure that we are are both trying to mitigate against some of the things that that produce um, climate change but also how do we at the same time start or continue to adapt to climate change because there's a lot of inertia in the system. And so even if we stopped all of the greenhouse gas emissions or the land use changes today, there still will be some of these um, changes continuing to propagate simply because that's how the system works. And so I think um, now is sort of like a critical time to see how to, to bring these pieces of adaptation and mitigation together so that we can try to improve the way in which we are resilient as a society and, and as a world. When it comes to the agreements, the decisions um, made by the United States, made by some of our allies in Scotland, um, and we take a look at the deliverables, when can we see some of it put into use? When can we see the results? So, so that's a, an interesting and a challenging question, Lauren, because um, the, the time scale at which um, decisions and laws are made um, vary across the world. And I think uh, what we have seen and what we probably will continue to see is that um, the multiple scales at which decision making occurs and the multiple um, ways of addressing climate change continue, whether it's from a local perspective. So from a local climate action plan, for example, things that take place on a, a municipal level, some of the more regional um, uh, groupings that are, are in place and will continue to be in place. And those I think are the ones that sort of um, all add up to that collective change while we wait for some of the more federal or national pieces to occur. So I think we need that multi-pronged approach. Okay, excellent. Dr. Leslie Ann dupini Giroux, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on, on 2244.